Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Alfred, and of course, dear Alla in absence, uh, it's a great pleasure for me, and uh, at the same time, a big honor that I may now give you the first lecture within this framework of the conference. Many thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will have noticed that chronologically, my topic has little to do with a Hanuk period. But uh, according to the organizers of the conference, as one of the main goals of the first section of this conference, uh, a diachronic approach in order to enable a chronological comparison to the main theme, that means the Hanuk period and the interaction between the different cultures, which is here in the Northern Black Sea area. So, ladies and gentlemen, this leads to the fact that I may now explain to you some ideas about the intercultural context on the banks of the book in the pre-Christian centuries, and that means more exactly about the Olbian, Scythian context in the later Chinook and early Classical period. So, Alfred, can you give me the next slide? The question... Can you give me the next slide? Uh. Panie Dariuszu, następny slajd, jeśli można, tylko znowuż nie przełączył pan chyba okna. Okay, just continue to so the next slide. We come soon, uh, I guess. So the question of a Scythian influence in Olivia in the 6th and uh, 5th century BCE is undoubtedly one of the most interesting but at the same time also one of the most discussed problems concerning this ancient Akolkia. And uh, this although or just because the relevant sources are very limited. So, for example, contemporary literary sources are limited to a few mentions in the so-called Scythian Logos of Herodotus in which the ancient author outlines uh, the relationship of the Scythian king's Scylus to the Greek city. I'm sure you all know this corresponding reports, and I would like to, on the second side, show you the main two sentences in an English translation, but we do not see until now. No, okay. Um, despite of the limited literary sources, Yuri Germanovich Vinagradov reconstructed in the 1980s a relationship of dependence between the Olbia Polites on the one hand and the local allies on the other hand, which our Moscow colleague formed over the years into a coherent history of events. Beside the written sources, Vinagradov additionally cited archaeological evidence. For example, the so-called Leoxos stele from the first quarter of the fifth century BC, we will see it on the second slide, uh, together with uh, some graves with people killed by arrows as an evidence of military conflicts between the Greeks and the Scythians in this time. Further on, a significant reduction of the Olbian Shore, also in the first quarter of the 5th century BCE, and as the last example in this context, so-called Aminakos coins from the second half of the century as numismatic evidence of a Scythian ruler or his representative in the city. Uh, also, we will see this on the second slide. Um, Vinagrado's reconstruction of the Olbian history were strongly opposed by many scholars of the ancient studies, first of all by our colleagues from Kiev. And the results of this long-term critical discussion, which to a certain extent has also become a discourse among the disciplines, that means the ancient history and epigraphy versus the archaeology, is more or less a common rejection of Vinagrado's so-called protectorate uh, however, a convincing alternative had, has not been proposed so far, so that our colleague Victor Koyokaro noted in a paper still in 2008 that, first of all, a new compilation of all written data with an outstanding commentary is needed, which are relevant for the context between the Greeks and the barbarians 
and the northern and western Black Sea. And only then, only in a second step, according to Koyokaru, the numismatic and archaeological findings can be taken into consideration. Oh yeah, thanks very much. And the left above, you can see this, uh, the main two sentences uh, in the traditions of Herodotus in an English translation. Left uh, uh, on the bottom, there's the uh, stele of uh, Leoxos, and uh, on the top on the right, you can see the so-called Minakos uh, coins. Um, but once again, this uh, this mention of uh, this, this view of uh, Koryako, I would like to repeat uh, so you can uh, better understand it, uh, that first of all you need this outstanding uh, commentary of all the written sources and then only in the second step uh, the numismatic and archaeological findings can be taken into consideration. But uh, yeah, Jochen, excuse me, apology for the technical problems, but we are now about okay. So uh, we are at the second slide, please, if you okay. Keep... Okay. Which slide you want now to to this be? The second slide is okay. The second slide is correct, okay. and okay. then you can continue. Okay, but ladies and gentlemen, is this scientific approach of Victor Koyokawa to the question of cultural in and around all the convincing other results of archaeological excavations, especially for this question, less important than the written sources, and can they be used only as a supplement for the few written information we have? In my opinion, some doubts about this statement are appropriate based on two points. First, in contrast, to the written sources, many new results of the settlement history of Olbia have been obtained, especially in research, which can be used for further investigation. And second, in the best case, archaeological observations can illuminate longer periods of time. They can document important changes in urban development, which is also a reflection of prosperity of an ancient Greek city at the borders of or to a foreign culture. That means the advantage of settlement historical perspective lies especially in the diachronic approach by written sources on the one hand, maybe more detailed in the map, but on the other hand, in most cases, with a very limited focus chronolog chronologically. Because of the short time available for a lecture, I would like to explain this with only one short example. I would like to pursue the question to what extent the tradition of Herodotus can be aligned with the archaeological findings at all. And this begins with the question of the so-called proastion of Olbia mentioned by the ancient author. Can you give me the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you very much. When the Ukrainian archaeologist Yulia Ivanova Kozy found the first traces of settlement of the classical period west of the so called Corset in the mid of the 1960s, a part of the research community very quickly connected the remains with the Coastion of Herodotus. In contrast to this, other scholars pointed out that the Greek term proastion is not necessarily to be identified as a suburb in modern in our modern sense. And according to them, the proastion first of all means the area in front of or outside the city and does not necessarily have to mark an urban structure. It is no wonder that in the following time, very different ideas were expressed about the urban development of this area and also about the origin and social status of the people living there. At least commonly noted were only the unusual existence of dugout structures, which already seemed anachronistic in the 5th century BCE, as well as the lack of convincing evidence for the presence of Scythian workers who were 
according to Herodotus, temporarily lived here in the suburb while waiting for the king Sculis, who was in the city Intramuros. Although the archaeological finds from the suburb obviously couldn't directly confirm this story by Herodotus, the idea of a connection between the Scythians and an Olbian suburb was no longer abandoned. Once born, this idea could not be ignored. For example, it has been proposed that in the first quarter of the 5th century BCE, an increased military pressure from a very powerful Scythia led the population from the Olbian Shura to seek refuge in the city itself, where they temporarily live in a new settled suburban area in these areas. In other words, the existence of the suburb was a direct result of a conflict situation between the Scythians and the Greeks. And in absence of convincing archaeological evidence, individual objects such as a Leopsus stele already mentioned were subordinated to this reconstruction and understood at the same time as its confirmation. And this was the origin of the so-called protective theory of Yuri Vinokrov. And further on, the mention of a city wall was also taken as an evidence that a fortification already existed around the Olbian core city during Herodotus' lifetime, which, however, has not yet been archaeologically confirmed. Thus, the argumentation become more and more circular. Although the presence of the Scythians in the so-called suburb could not be proven, this suburb was at least indirectly connected to it. And although there was no archaeological evidence of a city wall around the core city, it must have existed, since Herodotus claims to have seen it. So, Herodotus advanced as an eyewitness, and his statements thus as evidence. A literary tradition as fact, as a level of interpretation to which the archaeological findings were subordinated. But ladies and gentlemen, at this point, let us take a brief look at the current archaeological situation and at the new results of our Ukrainian German project here in Olbia. It just has already been pointed out several times in the past that nowhere in the Shova a destruction horizon nor other traces of any kind of pressure from the Scythians can be proven which could confirm the postulated migration of people to the city of Olbia. And uh, second, the fact is also pointed out many times that the arrival air area in the so-called suburb of Olbia would be far away from being large enough to accommodate so many new inhabitants from all of the abandoned settlements in the Shura. Could you open the next slide, please? And third, and the following points are the new results of our own project. Extensive excavations along the so-called Western Road, you can see it here in the, in the slide. This uh, excavation has shown that settlement activities in this area began already in the second half of the 6th century BCE. That means much more earlier than assumed so far. A direct connection between the beginning of the so-called suburb and the extensive abandonment of the agricultural settlements can therefore not be shown. Thus, one of the main arguments of the protectorate theory is invalid. And fourth, the find from the late Ashai dugouts of the suburb correspond in their quantity as well as quality to the findings from the core city. Differences are not visible. Also, at least for the area along the western road in the 5th century BCE, the transition to ground level buildings can be proven, which was known so far only from the core city. And that means that the late Ashaik in the early classical periods, there is no difference in the urban development of the core city on the one hand and the so called suburb of the other hand. You can see here one example 
with so-called uh, Deckard structure and number 16 from the uh, second um, half of the sixth century BC along the so-called Western Road. Uh, can you give me the next slide, please? And fifth, also in the last quarter of the sixth century BCE, two extraordinary building complexes were built in the northwest and southwest of the suburban. The northern complex is here. Uh, you can see it here with the number four in the plan uh, on the right side. This northern complex was already investigated by Julia Kosov in the 1960s and interpreted by her as the central. The southern complex is here number five. It could only be lo localized in 2017 by a geomagnetic prospection. Shows remarkable parallels to the complex investigated by the project already after the first two excavation campaigns in 2018 and 2021. And this is distinguished from the characteristic settlement structures of this field simply because of the size of 10 to 20 meters. And in addition, once again, the plan on the right side, please. You their location. Those buildings correspond excellently with a better research terminal of the core city. The impression is that the Olbian settlement area had an early and possible separate boundary, like Plato described in the ideal process of the building of a new city where several zones should mark the boundaries. Of course, our work is in the newly discovered but complex is still ongoing and we are still waiting for the final results. But however, already now all structures together indicate undoubtedly a clear structured urban planning in the late Ashaic times. Can you give me the next slide, please? Yes, thank you very much. And finally, the localization of a fortification system from the end of the 6th century, beginning of the 5th century BCE succeeded. But in the western part of Olbia and not around the core city as it was postulated based on Herodotus. This new world village system is the oldest fortification of Olbia, closes the entire settlement territory to the west in a semicircle, and unites at the same time, and this is essential, the core city as well as the so-called suburban area to an undivided settlement area. The area to the west of the core city was no but part of the settlement area protected by one and the same fortification. A settlement which in the West served mainly for residential purposes in the 6th and 5th century BC, while in the eastern part, from the beginning of the settlement, there were mostly areas for public or sacred functions. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a current archaeological evidence for urban development in Olvia in the late Ashaic and early classical periods. But what is the conclusion from these remarks? Let us sum up what has been said from an archaeological perspective. Can you give me the next slide, please? The new archaeological evidence shows for the last quarter of the 6th and the first half of the 5th century BCE an implementation of a fundamental and consistent planning concept for the urban area of Olbia. The location of already fixed and also the postulated sanctuaries, the construction of a fortification around the entire city area, the urban development in the so-called suburb, and finally, the chronological sequence of all of these structures confirm such kind of a planning system. And how far-sighted this process was planned is shown by the location of the Archaic necropolis. You can see this here in the, uh, in the middle a picture with uh, the Roman numbers one, two, three. Because uh, of the, um, um, what's planned is shown by the location of uh, the Ashaic necropolis, which from the very beginning completely marked out the future settlement area, although in large parts 
it still was, uh, was an open, undeveloped area. And this can only mean that a large scale settlement was planned from the beginning and was realized at a certain point in time. Especially these last mentioned results are new for Olvia and they will significantly determine the reconstruction of urban history in the future. But the direct comparison with other Greek colonies, for example, in the West and the Magna Grecia, also already shows some of our results are very similar to the archaeological situations in the ancient West, far away from our area. In the current stage of research, the mentioned phenomena even look like some characteristic steps in the founding of a Greek colony, regardless of the different local situations in the West and in the East. It's looked like, let's say, like a kind of a master plan that also plots and which we can possibly identify in the archaeological evidence. Our current Ukrainian German research project is especially dedicated to this question, and I can say we are on a really good way. A special trigger for the decision to reach the next level of urban development in Olbia started from the last, of the last quarter of the sixth century and continued in the century BCE is both. The archaeological and literary sources are silent. However, it is more than likely that the inhabitants must have considered the whole situation at the banks of the river Brook that they decided to take this step. This and the just mentioned urban prosperity clearly speaks against a tense situation on site. The late Ashraq fortification should be understood in the same way. Just the fact that this fortification enclosed a territory of altogether about 70 hectares, which was in fact only to a small extent already urbanistically developed, shows in the same way as the location of the necropolis a foresighted planning. A fortification that would have had to be erected against threatening enemies would undoubtedly have been built more pragmatically and with much more less effort around a smaller territory. Oliver Hilden recently summarized this in his detailed publication about the archaic fortifications in the Greek world and especially in the Magna Great Sea world. It must be pointed out that the newly built circuit walls did not apparently determine the framework, but were added only after planning of the settlement had been completed. And in other words, the fortification as an important, as a final step of planning of a settlement. And I think the new archaeological context in Olbia seems to be a very good confirmation of this idea. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude the summary of my lecture. Could you give me the next slide, please? The aim of my talk was to underline the importance of the interpretation of archaeological features. In contrast to what has been done in research so far, and the question of the audience skeptical context, I propose to first use the possibilities and limitations of these archaeological discoveries before we conclude the undoubtedly important written sources for a reconstruction of historical processes. The results of this approach are as follows. First, Olbia apparently developed according to plan in the 6th, 5th century BCE, obviously without any major disruption. An initial comparison with colonies from the Magna Graecia also implies a typical cause of urban development. It's a fundamentally negative intercultural relationship between Scythians and the Olbian to be recognized. Second, it is not possible to link the Proastion, which is recorded in Herodotus, with the urban structures to the west of the so called coast city. A suburb in the modern sense did not exist here in the 5th century BCE, 
If at all, the term pro osteo must be understood to mean the open area far up to the west beyond uh, the necropolis. And furthermore, and this is very important, Herodotus used this story about Scylus as an example to describe conflicts that can arise when there is too much cultural overlap. But Herodotus described these conflicts as an internal Scythian affair and not as an expression of Scythian control over the Milesian colony, which, and in my opinion, my own opinion, the ancient historian never visited. And third, the reduction of the Shura is a phenomenon that we still cannot completely explain. That is a but, and this is really a big but. That the reduction of the Shura is, as described, not the trigger for the development of the city, and thus cannot be cited as an evidence for a change of intercultural relation. It is especially in this question that the advantage of a diachronic approach becomes evident. In my opinion, the Olvian Scythian context in the late Ashanti and classical periods were mostly peaceful and a win win situation for all concerned. This does not mean, of course, that there were no local or temporary conflicts. There also always have been conflicts wherever people met, and there were conflicts undoubtedly also around and in Olvia. But we have no evidence that such conflicts had extended over a long period of time, or that they had had an impact on the development of the city itself. And just to avoid any misunderstandings, in my eyes, interdisciplinary cooperation is the best way to conduct scientific research. But each discipline should first fully exploit its own possibilities in order to create the best possible base for networking with other disciplines. In an interdisciplinary approach to the Olympian Scythian context, and this seems to me to be the difference to Victor Koyokari's view, the results of archaeological research should provide the background in front of which the literary references can be evaluated. Otherwise, there is a risk that only individual archaeological objects will be used for interpreting, while the context as an important source of information is ignored. The protector word theory is a negative example for this. This theoretical approach is not limited to classical antiquity, but is perhaps valid also for other periods of Olbian history, and thus maybe also for the Hanic period. Give me the last slide, please. And for this reason, ladies and gentlemen, my lecture may perhaps also make some sense in the context of a very interesting conference about the Hanek period at the banks of the book. Thank you very much for your attention.